Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's special episode of the Dr. Keith Darrow podcast, where we have the honor of sitting down and interviewing David Kemp. Now, many in hearing healthcare know David for all the work that he's done, him and his family, actually. So if you've ever held an oak tree catalog, David, you got one? There it is. <laughs> if you've ever held an oak tree catalog, you're looking at the guy. And look, he's not just the person you go to when you need more tympanometry tips. Uh, David has really done a lot in the last five years. I know David has an invested interest in the future of hearing healthcare, but he's got a he's got a podcast uh, this week in hearing, which everybody knows about, everybody reads. So, David, welcome to the show, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Keith. I really appreciate being here. Um, it's been cool to see you emerge and uh, listen to your podcast. You do a great job with it. So it's awesome to just see this like little creator economy in our incredibly niche industry emerge. And um, all the collaboration that takes place is really exciting, in my opinion. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think I think there's this big organic movement because people are finally saying, we are the difference, right? The hearing healthcare provider is the difference maker. And we have an opportunity to help 50 million people in this country. We have an opportunity, right? Medicine has helped people live a much longer life. We have the opportunity. We are at the forefront of making sure they live their best life and live active. And even though I, I know you're you're not an audiologist per se, you play a real important role in that. And could you give us a little bit of your backstory, your why, your your passion, how you got into this? Sure. Yeah. So as you mentioned, Oak Tree, um, you know, I am uh, genetically predisposed to the hearing healthcare world. I was kind of thrust into it when I was uh, three years old and my parents started this company. So just like a really quick backstory there, um, my dad was a uh, at the time, a pharmaceutical rep for the company that makes Debrox. And uh, he wanted to, um, in the late 80s, early 90s, wanted to start to sell this to this like new subset of the ENT market, audiology, that was going to be performing serum and uh, management. And so the powers that be there kind of shut him down, said that we don't want to disrupt the golden goose that are the ENTs. And so at the time, we as a family were like relocating all the time. And uh, my parents are both from St. Louis, wanted to move back home. And so uh, the original idea of Oak Tree was a single product company. Um, my dad had this idea that it was going to be like in Walmart and CVS and all these different big box retailers and stuff like that. And uh, like flash forward, that actually never panned out because it was um, it just wasn't really as, as feasible as I guess he initially thought. Um, but he did launch his uh, flagship brand, Audiologist Choice. And um, what became really apparent to him and my mom, who was his business partner, um, was that uh, the distributors in the industry um, maybe were a little bit lacking and that we could use uh, some some Midwest values, I guess, uh, you know, <laughs> really good customer service um, and uh, exceptional quality of, of service. So anyway, that's how Oak Tree was kind of born. And um, like you mentioned, we have our catalog. This is our 30th year. And each year, I believe we've released the catalogs. So first it was like four pages and then seven pages and then 15 pages. And so, you know, over time, it's bigger it was just, than most textbooks now. Exactly. So, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where, you know, it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And, and our whole mantra has always been that, like, if there's anything that the hearing professional needs, come to us and we'll add it. And at this point, we now carry over like 5,500 products. Wow. Um, so that's a quick backstory on Oak Tree. And I joined the company full time. Like I'd always worked here in the summers when I was growing up, I was like the janitor. And then I was, <laughs> you know, working in all the different departments, um, working in the warehouse, all that. And uh, I decided that I wanted to come back and work for the family company. And um, at the time, my brother was a few years into the job. So he and I kind of linked up here together and, um, along with the uh, new leadership team that we have now that my parents have both retired. Um, Is that a, a hostile takeover? Or? <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> no, very, uh, very, very uh, amicable. But, um, but anyway, you know, 
for me, like my role in the company was, um, I was sort of tasked with like, you gotta, you know, figure out how to grow this thing. And I didn't know necessarily where to start. And, uh, like I just tried to play to my strengths, which was, I had a degree in, um, marketing and in strategic communication. So I was like, all right, well, I'll start a blog, <laughs> uh, you know, as one does with those backgrounds, I guess. And so sure, anyway, yeah. <laughs> it I, made uh, sense. yeah, so I, I started the blog and, um, the whole purpose of future year was like, I, I got really excited because I have this passion for, you know, technology and stuff like that. And it felt like there wasn't like a ton of, uh, people that were covering that. So I felt like there was a little bit of an in Definitely so not started in 2017. To, no. Yeah, so no. I started, I started writing about like this whole idea of, you know, like, uh, hearables. And the whole idea was like a hearable is just more or less a computerized in the ear device. And this idea of like, okay, so as like the iPhone transformed the whole, the, the phone and the whole notion of what we think of a phone today, I kind of felt like there's an opportunity that maybe these computerized earbuds would do the same for, um, everything from headphones to hearing aids. Sure. And so that's what I started writing about was, uh, I, like the tagline was connecting the trends converging around the ear. And so just started to, you know, kind of write these essays about like, you know, here's what it would mean uh, from, you know, if biometric sensors start to be integrated into the devices, like this is the kinds of use cases that that would enable. And I kind of would do this for all these different emerging technologies. Like here's how the app economy that's built around these devices might take shape. And so that was kind of the first iteration of future ear. And then from now, there, I got, but I got to, I got to ask, I hope you don't mind the interruption, but I have to no. ask I'm, I'm picturing you, your brother, your mom and dad sitting around the <laughs> dinner table and you say, you know what, dad, I'm going to bring Oak tree into the next generation and I'm going to do a blog. <laughs> and I mean, he's yeah. like, well, I that. You just got to sell more you know, tympanometry tips or, or, you know, you got to do more of the D brocks. Like that doesn't make any sense. At least that would be my dad. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually really funny. You say that because there was a period of time where like the pre blog era, what it was, was me sending these really long witted emails to my dad and uh, like my brother and AU. And I think that like, I noticed the response times were getting less and less. So that eventually my dad was like, why don't you just like, publicly share this if you feel so inclined. And I was like, that's not a bad idea. So there wasn't actually a real direct, uh, like a game plan per se. Okay. It, was, it was sort of more of like, I need, like he tasked me with, you need to find a way to get to the podium. That's what he said. Yeah. You know, get, start to work on your chops so that you can present publicly and and work on your public speaking and start to kind of brand yourself. And so I, first thing I needed to do was I needed to determine what the subject was going to be that I was going to write about. And, um, and so anyway, that's what I gravitated toward was like the technology side of this industry. And it ended up being kind of fortuitous because as about 2017, you then had the introduction of AirPods. And then that's when it was like, this is actually getting really serious because Apple had a a home run on their hands with AirPods. And that sort of validated this whole notion of like, the big boys are going to come in. The tech players are going to come in. They're going to kind of reinvent the way that this is done. There's going to be a whole lot more consumer interest. And a lot of that stuff actually panned out to be true. Um, and so from there, it allowed for me to sort of like uh, use that and parlay it into, okay, the next thing I want to do is a podcast. And obviously I needed guests. And so I started to use the people that I had met through the blog about what I was writing about. A lot of these people I discovered through Twitter. I was a big Twitter guy. And, um, you know, especially in that time, it was an unbelievable way to really identify subject matter experts in every different walk of life. So I was able to kind of like hone in on like, this person's really knowledgeable about voice technology. This person's really knowledgeable about biometric sensors. And so that served as the foundation for the podcast of the people that I brought on. And then what happened was from there, it sort of started to become something where I started to get a lot of interest from like audiologists that were curious to uh, share how they were actually using some of this new technology. One thing led to another. And now the podcast is almost entirely talking about the role of audiology, like moving into the future. That's how sure. it all sort of evolved. And now what I'm focusing on is basically like, how does audiology stay relevant and how does hearing healthcare evolve um, while 
being quote unquote under siege by these threats that I personally don't really feel are threats. I think that they're forcing functions to uh, the in, to challenging the status quo that I think is actually a really good thing. Well, I think I think that the most important thing that has happened in our industry, which you just sort of pointed out, is the challenge to the status quo. The status quo has always been help less than 20% of people with hearing loss. And if I were something other than an audiologist or a neuroscientist, if I were a businessman or an engineer, I would say that there's 80% of people being underserved. There's 42 million people that need help. It makes perfect sense to try to infiltrate this field because if you can take five or ten percent of the piece of pie, you could make a decent, you know, a decent wad of cash doing that. But I think what we're seeing is now there's this change wherein the audiologist, the hearing healthcare provider, even the the HIS, everybody's standing up and saying, "Wait a second, wait a second. I know I've been talking about the widget forever. I've been trying to sell a widget. My website talks about widget. My marketing talks about widget. But at the end of the day, the widget is this much of what I actually do. Right. And so now there's this great new focus on the value that we provide, looking at the data, looking at the, the clinical and medical outcomes of treating hearing loss and tinnitus and associated cognitive needs. And it's like, finally, people are waking up saying, hey, wait a second, I really do have value. You know, yes. it's like that old Saturday Night Live skit, look in the mirror, gosh darn it, I am good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good enough. Uh, yes, yeah, Stuart Smalley. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I completely agree. And I think that like, uh, you know, the, the best way to like really think about this or, or at least the way that I always do, so not saying it's the best, but this is how I always think about it, is that the the actual like facilitation of hearing devices and the dispensing of hearing devices is becoming commoditized. Um, you can see it all over the place. I mean, you can get really quality hearing aids from some big box retailers that practice best practices um, for the fitting of a hearing aid. And you can do that relatively economically and cost effective versus what you could even five years ago. And so in a commoditized world, where how can you stand apart? Well, it's all about, I think, being a provision of knowledgeable expertise. Mm -hmm. That's where the value lies. And it plays to your strength as an audiologist or even as uh, you know, other healthcare prof uh, hearing healthcare professionals like the hearing instrument specialists, where you know, you're still certified, you still have um, a license to stand on. And I think that with this, it's it's all about just a matter of figuring out how do you take your value and then find a way to monetize it. And this has been, I think, at the root of everything is like there haven't been obvious ways to do it, but that's changing, I think, in some pretty meaningful ways. And it just seems like we're kind of just getting started because it's like it seems as if there's been this sort of um, collective aha moment uh, within the industry where in one way or another, I think a lot of people are coming to this conclusion of like, I have to set up, I have to set myself apart uh, in a meaningful way. And I think there's a variety of different ways that you can do that. But again, what I think has dramatically changed even in the last like two to three years is I think it's becoming kind of uh, apparent as to how you can make money by going in these different directions and opening yourself up to be more than just like you said, the widget. Yeah. Well, I think you really, you hit the nail on the head there. And I can tell you what we're doing at our, you know, this may be my, my podcast show, but one of my other hats that I wear uh, is being part of the odd experts movement, which is we really champion private practice. And our ultimate goal is to help the private practitioner build their own trust and authority to help them separate from the pack, right? I mean, there isn't a community where you can't find 10 or more hearing healthcare providers, places that sell hearing aids, however you want to think of it. But if you want to be different, you've got to build your trust and authority. And I, I love the message here, and I hope people are getting this. What David, what you've done, Oak Tree, which is just, you know, to most people, it was just a catalog where you bought stuff to, to put into your audiology practice. David has shown that 
building trust and authority through different venues will bring people to you. It keeps Oak Tree at the forefront. It keeps anybody who's considering opening, you know, Pine Tree at bay because they realize (laughs) that you have built this empire, if you will, of this is what we do. We are the experts. We don't just sell stuff in a catalog. And I think that that there's such a great lesson to learn from you in this. Well, I appreciate that. I think that um, goes back to sort of the mentality that was instilled in me by Bob, my dad. And also I think it was imparted on me by AU as well, which is this idea of, um, like I said, getting to the podium, but like also the sense of um, being an expert in something and, uh, and not just saying you're an expert, but actually like having something that you can use to reference as to why. And I think that for me, it was like doing a whole lot of research and understanding and writing about, um, like I said, the tech innovation, but like with my dad, it goes all the way back to when he and AU first met and, uh, they were both honing in on being experts in infection control because it was sort of right on the heels of the AIDS epidemic. And, uh, at the time it was like, there wasn't really, um, you know, there were all these new standards that were put into place, but there was sort of this gap that was like, how do you actually implement that as a hearing healthcare professional? Because obviously those OSHA standards were applicable to like every type of healthcare professional. And so again, it's just taking, um, trying to figure out like, where is the gap in the market? And for me, where I think the gap is in the market today is there's so much information. I think you do a really good job with this too, of trying to kind of figure out, okay, uh, there's a lot of information, but there's a lot of really smart people out there. And how do you make sure that those people have an opportunity to share their perspective? Because you know this as well as I do, that when you, as soon as you start creating content, it serves as a magnet. And that magnet attracts other people, other creators, other interested parties, more or less. And so um, with This Week in Hearing, like that's that was the whole idea of it was... Uh, the, the problem isn't that there's a lack of good ideas in smart people. The challenge was there's not a really good platform for people to go and actually have their content produced. And so that's what we did with it. It was really just the idea of like, we figured out how to actually do the post-production work on the back end, how to like instruct people. It's not like rocket science, but just how to actually facilitate doing a podcast discussion and hosting your own episode and kind of getting people comfortable with it. And so that was the whole motivation for that was really, again, it's just this idea that everybody's really busy. People are good at what they're good at and they don't know what they don't know. And so if, if I can help to give people, I, you know, I've been doing podcasting for like three or four years now. So I kind of understand how to actually do it. Um, Mm -hmm. not necessarily well, but I can say that I know how to, I know how to, you know, go from start to finish. And so that was the idea there was like, just to give people, um, the tools and the wherewithal to have these kinds of conversations. And again, I just think that speaks to this broader point of like, One of the things that I'm really excited about and encouraged by is it seems like there's a really open dialogue right now, particularly on these podcasts and these different YouTube shows where people are very candidly talking about, here's what I'm doing within my business. Here's ways I'm setting myself apart, actionable things. It's not like all esoteric, you know, like I'm... 10 X in my business. Well, how, you know, these are people that are saying like, this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm adding these additional services. I'm hiring these kinds of people for these kinds of different roles. So in that regard, I'm really optimistic about what I'm seeing because it feels like there has been sort of a wall that's come down a communication wall where there seems to be more transparency and open dialogue than at least I've observed in this industry since I've been in. in Oh, definitely. I've been in the industry for 20 years and it seemed as though the default voices were either the ASHA or the AAA or the manufacturers. And we were just, you know, supposed to get in line and I don't know, do what we were told, <laughs> mm-hmm, right. pay what, pay whatever prices sell the way they told us to sell and, and all these things. Whereas mm-hmm. now there's really this, this grassroots effort to say, no, we're in charge, right? Let, let the organizations, they have their voice, let them say what they want to say, but now we can speak openly. We can speak candidly. We can actually 
agree to disagree. Imagine that, right? Like yeah, right. bundled, unbundled, like it's okay. Everybody has their own model. At the end of the day, there are 42 million people sitting on the sidelines that need our help. And so we've got to band together. We have to be more forthcoming, more candid with our processes because there's not enough of us. If, if 10% of the 42 million decided that they wanted to seek treatment tomorrow, we would all have a wait list for years, probably, you know? I, I feel like this uh, gets at a huge part of this, which is there's been, if it feels like for a long time, this industry has been sort of um, uh, plagued by a scarcity mentality. Like there's only so many patients to go around. That's my patient. That's my prospective <laughs> patient. And, yes. you know, if you actually kind of unwind, like why that might be, it's somewhat understandable. You know, again, the patient acquisition cost, like the customer acquisition cost is quite high. You got to pay a lot of money. So you, I can see how people might get upset that their quote unquote patients are getting, um, you know, uh, poached by the big box retailer or the other practice down the street. But to your point, there's, we have dramatically like limited our imagination as to how many people need help. And again, I think that this gets at where we were talking earlier about like this whole status quo. And I think that uh, this idea that like, I, even if I'm an audiologist, the, you know, the way I make revenue is by selling hearing aids. And over the course of decades of this, it's like we as an industry have become so conditioned by it that it sort of has become, and again, I'm generalizing here. I'm not like really pointing fingers because I know this isn't entirely applicable, but it has been like a one trick pony. Um, it's pretty much become come to me for hearing aids. That's the perception that's been created with the public. And I think that we don't really talk about that enough of like, how do people actually see us rather than how do we want people to see us, which seems to be a lot of the infighting that you see a lot of the different, you know, opinions that get cast by these different boards and all that. And the very opinionated people that might be on like Facebook and that is that, you know, everybody has like, they, they want to just wish uh, the way that people see them into being. And the, the reality of the fact is most people probably don't even know what an audiologist is. And the people that do, the only reason they do is it's because that's the person that my mom went and saw for a hearing aid. That's the person that my friend went and saw, whatever it might be. So in a sense, we've pigeonholed ourselves in an, in, as an industry really into just being affiliated and synonymous with hearing aids. And again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, which is this idea of we need to reclaim and the we as in like the proverbial the entire industry needs to reclaim the full scope of what this practice, this uh, medical professional was designed to do. And if I think we can come together and do that, that's gets to the 42 million people like there will not be a shortage in the amount right. of people that want to seek you out for your services because you can rebrand yourself as being something so much more. Um, both to the patients, but also to the to the broader medical community, which is important too. I I think you you said it perfectly and absolutely much nicer than I would because I pretty <laughs> much run around saying we hearing healthcare providers need to pull our head out of our collective asses, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it. I mean that's that's just because of my level of frustration with yeah. it. But you make such great points of we're fighting over you know, the low hanging fruit, let's try a little bit harder. And how do we get to the fruit that's up above, right? If you think about the allegory of the apple tree story mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, ultimately, I believe the problem is with the university and the education part of, of it. And I think that's where it starts because look, I think there's great education. I love the coursework. I think some of the changes to the AUD were fantastic, but these students still come out, A, not doing best practices, which is very disturbing. And I'm in the middle of a research project looking at that. And it's very alarming to see that universities, university clinics, externships are not doing best practices. So, so there's part of the problem. And then we're never really taught how to treat more patients because I swear the university sees that as, well, that's selling, right? Mm -hmm. That That's selling. You know, 
making a strong recommendation might, you know, influence a patient to, to make a decision that maybe they wouldn't have made otherwise. Look, treating hearing loss is not an option. And I'm, I'm pretty black and white with that. It is not an option, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make my recommendation. You may, the patient always has a right to choose and they may say no, but I'm never going to give them an out of, well, you know, we could wait till next year. Yeah. It's, it's okay. If you decide not to No, it's, it's not okay. This is the recommendation. These are the reasons why, and should you choose not to? Okay. Right. I, I often, you know, it's part tongue in cheek, like, 95% of patients who are told by their oncologist that I'm going to poison you with chemotherapy. Yeah. Right. 95% of patients say, yes, let's do it. Right. And here we are. I don't think we're offering any sort of poison, right? We're actually offering an active aging lifestyle. We're offering patients the ability to stay in their home longer, to reduce their risk of cognitive decline and dementia, to have a higher quality of life. Like, there is no bad to treating hearing loss. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a couple of things to what you said there. So uh, just touching on the point right there. Um, I mean, I think that we have to understand that, you know, if people have the expectation that I'm and, and I'm maybe begrudgingly coming to see you at the behest of, you know, like a loved one, a spouse, whatever that's saying you need to go and you need to see the hearing doctor. Um, chances are it, it's to your point about the oncologist is on the surface, this might feel like a sale, but as soon as I feel like it's a medical opinion, everything changes, but that's part of the problem is that the industry as a whole has put itself in this position where they're perceived as like retail salespeople. And, and I think that there's ways you can change that again, broaden your scope. There yeah. should, there should not be, it sh it should be about the diagnostics first. It should be understanding like where, like what's actually going on with you. And so therefore I think we need to, as an industry, really beef up the diagnostics and sure. get into the bigger picture. I mean, Jill Davis is one of my favorite audiologists that I've ever interviewed. I don't know if you've had her, you need to, if you haven't, where she said, you know, like all of these different tests, it's like a big jig jigsaw puzzle for her. And as the pieces come together by implementing cognitive screening, by having all of these different things that go beyond the audiometer, that go beyond just pure tone audiometry and into all of these other things that are clues into what's going on, she can form a much more comprehensive understanding of what's actually going on with that person and provide a different kind of opinion than just like looking at somebody and then very quickly saying you need a hearing aid. Sure. That's of course in the mind of, of the consumer that feels like I'm being sold. I think, well, um, I think, I think there's a, there's a lot to that, right? Yeah. I, I love uh, Jill Davis. Her and I are actually putting on a huge event uh, awesome. this coming October in Dallas. It's a big, it's all about audition and cognition. So it'll be myself, Jill Davis, uh, Doug Beck, uh, ENTs are joining us. That's going to be a, a fabulous opportunity uh, to learn more. And I'll finally get to meet Jill in person. But it, it's funny you say that because, no, I, I haven't actually met Jill. Uh, but that's exactly how I teach my undergraduate course in, in Introduction to Audiology, which is every patient is a puzzle. Yes. And you have the opportunity to put together the puzzle to actually diagnose your patient. Because if a patient walks into your office and says, I'm here because I have hearing loss. If an hour later they walk out saying, yeah, I have hearing loss and now I need a hearing aid. You didn't really do anything. They already knew that coming in. Mm -hmm. What new information can you give them to sway them into understanding the importance of treatment? And I think it starts with, uh, we did a survey a couple of years back, over 80% of websites in this industry, first and foremost, hearing aid, test yeah. drive, you mm -hmm. know, like a mattress, you know, sleep on it, here with it for a hundred days, craziness, right? So we've, we've almost created the problem, but I really, you know, we're not too far gone. I really do believe hearing healthcare has its brightest days ahead, which is what I want to kind of ask you about now, as we start to wrap this up, tell me about the way you see, I, I love your perspective because you can say, I'm, I'm not an audiologist, but I am invested in what happens in hearing healthcare. So what do you see the next 
three, five, 10 years looking like? I mean, you're right. I, I have a very vested interest in it and I <laughs> try to be as transparent as possible because I'm not trying to be deceptive or have people feel as if I have these like underlying motivations. But for me, it's very black and white. I want the, I want hearing the hearing professional to do well into the future, because that implies that my business of selling the clinical supplies they need to perform their job and see more patients will continue to do well. So that's, (laughs) there we go. Like that's my, uh, I've, I've now stated like my, my bias, if you will. Um, (laughs) And so anyway, I I think that going back to what you said, just to bring the whole thing uh, with the education system full circle is I agree with you that, um, you know, I'm not casting judgment on any one university or anything like that, but I think writ large, there needs to be more of a focus on hands-on experience of these other ancillary things. Vestibular is a really good one. I just did an episode on my podcast with Christina Coppola, who's this incredibly bright young uh, audiologist at the American Institute of Balance, and she's designed this whole Match Me program. And it's very interesting to hear her talk about this where, you know, because like, again, it's that boots on the ground perspective. It's not somebody that's just sort of observing things kind of like what I'm doing. I'm trying to get these perspectives and I am because I'm getting them from these firsthand accounts. And what she's saying is, you know, we're basically taking these these students, these externs that have expressed an interest in vestibular. Um, So I'm going to come back to that because I, I think this is important about my perspective of what's happening into the next five years. And I think that, you know, she's like the, what, what's happening is in that, uh, in the AUD program, there's like one or two courses on vestibular and that's the extent of it. And so unless you're exposed to that in your uh, clinical field work or your externship or something like that, chances are you're never going to get that experience. Um, or, or maybe you will down the line, but that's again, part of the problem is, the further along you get into your career, the more entrenched you become and the more uncomfortable you get with the idea of going back and having the humility to say, I actually don't know this portion of my scope and I need to go back to square one and learn it. So I think that there's a dramatically important emphasis on training the next generation on the full scope early. And so I think that that's a really important part of this is like providing people with hands-on experience of these whether it be cognitive screenings or if it be the vestibular side of things, tinnitus therapy, whatever it might be um, in rounding out the expertise. Because for me to answer your question about like where I see the industry going across the next five years is I think what we're going to see is a lot of pain um, in the next, in the short term, probably one to two years. I think, I think that I'm on the side that the self fit devices are actually going to be better than people are anticipating. And that goes back to, my interest in the technology of this is that sure. when we're talking about a self-programming device that is more or less using like, um, you know, the national acoustic lab, uh, standards and stuff like right. that, and they're able to program themselves in such a way, um, that part of the job, if you will, does feel very much like it can be automated, uh, to a certain degree. And so I think that what's going to happen is you'll probably have a portion of the industry that will just fail to adapt their, uh, and, and by that, it might mean they might sell, they might, uh, so there might be even more vertical integration. The buyers of that might be the big manufacturers. So they might just continue to beef up their retail arms. But I think that on the other side of this, the people that do take it upon themselves, and these are the kinds of people that I know are coming on your podcast, coming on my podcast, the people that are like truly carpe diem and seizing the opportunity to expand their scopes, I think the, that will completely redefine what audiology looks like. And I think those people will be sort of, uh, you know, class one, like the first cohort of generation two of audiology. And I think that they're going to set the, the new mark of like what it means to practice the full scope and how to make money doing it. That's the most important part of this is that I think we're going to see a dramatic pivot from hearing aids, which will remain to be a major part of this business. Um, but it will also expand into these other offerings. And I think the way this all works is it goes back to what you said earlier about the oncologist. So if you're practicing vestibular cognition and you go down the line and you have all of these different things, you're practicing to your full scope and you're able to, on a patient by patient basis, 
assemble the, the jigsaw puzzle, what does that ultimately lead to? It's the oncology analogy of being able to prescribe them with something. It's that medical opinion. It's saying we ran these seven different tests on you and we determined that the best thing for you is a hearing aid, or it might be a different kind of therapy treatment, whatever it might be. But that is, I think, how you can completely change the perception that people have, the public has over time is this is a medical professional that is Uh, that deals it's the ear doctor, but it's also the balance doctor and the tinnitus doctor. Um, and you know, the hearing conservation doctor, you know, it's audiology as we know it. And, and so I think that's maybe too optimistic. Like I said, I do think there will probably be a little bit of a Darwinian, like, um, you know, effect where it will be survival of the fittest and, and you'll probably see, I just continue to believe that the people that really do seize this, it will be a giant revelation for the people to come afterward, especially these new young professionals that are just entering. I think you're going to see this and understand the blueprint to follow is uh, you got to basically practice every ounce of your scope in some fashion, whether it's you personally or even your practice employing the right professionals to be able to be equipped to do all those different things. That's awesome. I mean, I, I'm, I think we're, we're perfectly aligned there in terms of what we see the future look like. I think that the um, the strong will survive, they will thrive, and they will set the course. I love your, you know, generation 2.0. <laughs> and, and then what we'll need is for that model to be adopted, backfilled into the university system so that there's not as much of a struggle when students come out and who are taught by, you know, old school, gray haired professors like myself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see. I mean, I think that the, um, there's a lot, it's, it seems to be that we're in probably one of the most definitive moments in this industry. Cause it does feel like we're kind of at a crossroads, like the OTC stuff, the self fit, the self fit stuff, all of that, I think is kind of a catalyst of, uh, it's, it's serving as I think just a giant wake up call of like, how do you provide value? And there are people that are, I think doing a really good job of figuring out this is how I, this is what I do different. And that that's the really interesting thing about this is that if you can actually clearly define what your value is and then communicate that to the market, you're actually the most defensible of all of these different avenues of care, retail audiology, um, and, you know, dispensing of hearing aids through online retailers. They're going to be a dime a dozen. They're going to all be at each other's throats. So that is the commoditized world that I'm referring to. So you want to get out of that if you can. And if you've already gone and you've gotten your AUD, you you've already like the half the battles over, you've already got your differentiator. Now it's just a matter of figuring out how do you package that in a commercial way to sell to the public? I know I'm not supposed to say sell, but you know, communicate <laughs> no, and, to the and public. never forget, <laughs> right? Let everybody fight over the 17%, the people who are yes. just, they're going to say, yes, they're so desperate. Just sell them a hearing aid. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the other 83%. There's a lot more of them and we're here to serve their need. David, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you have such such an amazing story. I love your, you know, couple of the catchphrases today. Get to the podium, build your trust <laughs> and authority, right? Generation 2.0. Uh, I think we're very aligned with this. I, I certainly look forward to meeting you in person someday, sharing a coffee or a drink and, and getting to know you better and, and everything that you're doing. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate you having me on. This has been great. Hey, let me ask you one, one last question. I had it written down. I don't want to forget. Where does the name Oak Tree come from? Great question. It's it was an acronym. I couldn't tell you what it was. It was like uh Odo Acoustic. I don't remember what the K through the tree was, but okay. the, we but it's actually it's I love the uh symbolism of a little acorn growing into a mighty oak tree. Yeah. Um and so that's that's the way I think of it. That's what we're going with then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> David, have a great day. Take care and thank you for all you do. Thanks, Keith.